how do we live with peace in a world that is not peaceful to us? Amen? How do you have peace, I'll give you just some scenarios, with a boss that is maybe not a believer, but is not at peace with you? That you're different. How about a coworker? You ever had a coworker that is not at peace with you? And yet you as a believer have to figure out how am I going to live in peace with this person? What about family? You ever had family issues? Oh my gosh. Parents? My parents aren't here. <laughs> you know why? Because, no, I'm just kidding. It's because of this. No. Uh, your, 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 your siblings. Ever had a brother or sister that you just are having a hard time try, trying to go to Thanksgiving dinner with these people? What about a child? You ever had a child disappoint you? A child that's hard to live in peace with? What about the government? Why y'all moaning? How many, how many days away are we from this, the ending of our proverbial hell? You know, I'm, you know what I'm saying? It's just hard. We have a world that is at constant odds. We're different. And yet, somehow, we have to ask the questions, can the church, can the Christians live in peace in a pagan culture? Is that even possible? And I say it is. Now, here's... Here's what's interesting. When Jesus was praying for his disciples in John chapter 15, or excuse me, John chapter 17, he didn't pray that, God, would you, Father, would you take my disciples, my men, and would you put them in a little holy bubble away from the world that they might not be corrupted and that hither henceforth thy word would grow in them. All right? He didn't say that. He said, I don't pray that you take them out of this pagan world, but that you would protect them from the evil one, right? Um, Jesus explains this earlier in John chapter 15. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. That's the idea. And we are always in contrast with that because we feel like if we're, if we're not being persecuted, then somehow we are of the world. But that's not necessarily the case always. He says, but because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world because this the world hates you. There's always going to be difficulty. It's never that life is going to be easy for us, but can the church somehow live peacefully in a pagan world? And I say yes. And we have great examples from the Word of God. We're going to get into 1 Peter chapter 3 in just a second, but before we do, I want to give us an example from the Old Testament of David who had to live at peace in a pagan world. So we're going to look first off in 1 Samuel 25. Pay, uh, excuse me, David, you know, was the at this point is the future king of Israel. Saul is trying to kill him at this point. I don't know if you know this. Saul is the king. David is the future king. Uh, and da uh, Saul is trying to kill David. David is on the run. And David goes down to a place called the Wilderness of Paran. And the Wilderness of Paran is practically in the Sinai Peninsula. It's where the, uh, the Israelites wandered for 40 years. It's in this wilderness. And he's down there because, one, it's away from Saul. It's safer down there. Number two, it's a very uh, harsh area. And it's an area where bandits and thieves like to, uh, like to go. And so he and his, you know, five, six hundred men that he has with him are down there. And what they're doing is they're earning a living, protecting people and shepherds as they take their flocks into this region to graze and to get fat. And so as he's in this area of the wilderness of Paran, he's basically come into contract with a specific man who has a lot of sheep and a lot of goats. And what he's done as he's kind of like a mercenary down there protecting flocks, protecting shepherds, making sure that they profit and that the bandits don't get everything. Now, as he's doing this, there's the sense that he's going to be paid for his work, he and his men. 
So I want to start with the, the second verse of the chapter 25 in 1 Samuel. And we're going to read a little bit of this, and I want to set the story up. It says, now there was a man in Milan whose business was in Carmel. Now, Carmel is just south of Jerusalem, up near the Dead Sea, the northern part of the Dead Sea, just east of the Dead Sea. And uh, Milan, excuse me, Carmel is just below that, and Milan is just below that. Milan's closer to the very bottom of the Dead Sea. Just give you an idea. The man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep, and a thousand goats, and it came about while he was shearing the sheep at Carmel. Now stop right here. It's going to be a little aside. Let me explain this. This is the end of the shepherding season, so to speak. They're now going to be making the profit. They've grown the sheep. The sheep have grown. Their, their wool has grown. Now they're going to take the goats, the sheep. They're going to shear them. They're going to take this, 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 and they're going to sell it, and it's kind of a festive time. There's going to be a celebration. People are getting paid for the work they've done. And so it's, it's, it's almost like the end of a season. So now all the shepherds have taken their flocks up here and they're shearing them in Carmel. Now let's look at about this man. Now the man, verse 3, his name is Nabal. And his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman, Abigail, was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. But the man, look at this, this is his reputation. He was harsh and evil in his dealings. And he was a Calebite. Now, you guys know Caleb and Joshua, they were the two of the spies that were sent out by Moses into the land, two of the twelve that came back and said, yes, we can take this land. He is of the tribe of Judah, the same as David. So he and David are relatives, distant relatives here, okay? Keep reading with me. Verse 4 kind of continues the thought of verse 2. So they're in Carmel that excuse me, that David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So he's hearing all this. Oh, okay, so now it's time to get paid. Nabal's taken his sheep. He's left the wilderness of Paran. He's taken his men up there, and now they're going to actually finish the job. Look at verse 5. So David sent 10 young men, and David said to his young men, Go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, greet him in my name, and thus you shall say. And listen to what he tells him to say. Now, I want you to remember, Nabal is a pagan, evil man. He is not a good guy. He has a reputation of not being a good guy. But look at how David speaks to Nabal. He says, have a long life. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. Now, I have heard that you are shearers. You have shearers. Now, your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let your young men, that's the servants, the men from David, find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at your hand for your servants and to your son David. Okay, so the groundwork here, if you can't get it already, is David is incredibly gracious, He's incredibly kind. He's gone into business with a man who is obviously not a good guy. And somehow, this good man, David, is going to do business and live in peace with this bad guy, Nabal. Right? You see how he's treated him with respect, how he's done everything uprightly. He hasn't taken advantage of the flock while he's out there. They haven't stole a few sheep just for themselves. He hasn't taken advantage of the, the, of the shepherds or the maids out there working and serving. He's protected them. At least that's his word. Now, I'm not going to read you Nabal's response, but I'm going to tell you. He says, who's David? I don't know you guys. This David, he's on the run from Saul. He actually calls David the son of Jesse, which is the name that Saul calls David. And it's almost a pejorative term. It's kind of talking down to David. I don't know who you guys are. Get out of here. And he spurns them and he sends them on their way. Well, the word gets back to David. And David, in his flesh, tells the guys, all right, mount up, boys. It's time to go take what's ours. And he gets 300 of his men. They put on their swords. They get on their horses. And they're going, basically, to, to kill Nabal and his whole family. And look at verse 15. Excuse me, verse 14. This word gets back to his intelligent wife, Abigail. Look what happens. 
But one of the young men who was with Nabal at the time said, told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. So is the world always going to treat us with kindness? Back up. Are we always going to treat one another with kindness? Are Christians even going to act right? No. As you see, David in his flesh is about to do something that he should not be doing. He's about to go take what he, what he deserves. An eye for an eye. You ought to, you owe me. An insult for an insult. Okay, he insults me. Let's go get him back. Right? Keep reading. Verse 15. Yet the men were very good to us. So this, this messenger is explaining our master's doing something really bad. These guys were above board. They, they lived what they said they believed. Keep going with me. And we're, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them. They protected us while we were in the field. Verse 16. They were a wall to us, both day and night, all the time we were with them tending the sheep. So David's reputation is that he did it right. Nabal's reputation is he's known for doing it wrong. Now, I'll give you a quick ending of the story. David doesn't kill Nabal. Matter of fact, Abigail grabs a, some of her servants says, they grab a bunch of stuff and they food and, and they take it out to him and they meet David's army on the way and she jumps off her horse and falls down in front of him. She says, my husband is acted foolishly. Forgive us. Take this. You have acted righteously. He has acted foolishly. And David comes off his horse, praises her for catching him in his own folly. And thanks her. And he goes back. She goes back. Later, she tells Nabal what happened. Nabal, the Bible says that his heart stopped in his chest. That he, it said that it, he died, but it took him 10 days to die. And he, he, God took his life. Now, I tell you this story because do we have to live in peace even when things don't go our way? And the answer is yes. It's a really hard thing for us to do, but the answer is yes with co-workers, with bosses, with siblings, with parents, with uh, the government. We have to figure out a way as the church to live in peace even when we know the people are evil that we're having to work with. I can't tell you how many, let's just stop real fast. I can't tell you how many Christians want to live in this beautiful bubble away from the world. You know, we homeschool our kids. We don't homeschool our kids because we're scared of the world. We homeschool our kids because of specifically the education we want our kids to have. And number two, we're, we're, we're wrestling with, my kids are a lot like me. I don't know if you guys know this. I couldn't read till the fourth grade. Yeah, kind of crazy. And so we didn't want that to happen to my son or my daughter. So in the beginning, we've decided to do this. We don't homeschool our kid because we're like, the world is evil. Ah! That's not what we're doing. But that's, so many Christians, they don't want to, you know, even in, in the voting process, I can't tell you how many Christians are like, I'm not going to vote. Because they, they don't want to vote for somebody evil. And yet, newsflash, we're talking about the government here, all right? If you think they're all a bunch of angels, surprise, they're not. Okay? You've been voting for corrupt people for years. All right. But that's my point is we want to live in this beautiful little holy huddle. We want to pass everybody a Coca-Cola and teach the world to sing. And the reality is, is that's not our world. But we want that. You know why? Because we, we, we long for our home. What's our home? It's heaven. Peter has said it multiple times in here that we are strangers, we are aliens, and so our very spiritual DNA is longing for, to be with Christ. It's longing to be home, and yet we're here. So we want this world that is uh, separate from any kind of evil and sin. But the problem is, is that's not the case. One, because we're sinful. We're broken. 
You and I are just as broken as everybody else. The difference is, is that Christ has entered our life, has saved us, has given us the Holy Spirit that we might walk in Him. That's the difference. And so we still have to figure out to ways to live in peace. If David can figure this out, 3,500 3, years ago, maybe we can too. So how do we do that? And now we're going to 1 Peter, because Peter tells us. He gives us how we do that. And what he does is he quotes David. He quotes David in Psalm 34, and he explains, David is saying, hey, let me show you how, how you do this. Look at the text. 1 Peter 3, 10 and 11. Peter is quoting Psalm 34. And look at what he says. This is just a quote. For the one who desires life, to love, see good days. If you want to live in peace, you want to live a long time, you want to have a good life, there's three things you do. You want to know what my points are? We're about to read them. This is the points of today's message. Look at what he says. Number one, he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Number two, verse 11, he must turn away from evil and do good. Number three, he must speak peace and pursue it. Now stop right there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to analyze these three things. But we start by going backward to verse 8 of 1 Peter 3. Okay? The first thing he says that we have to do, if we're going to live in peace, if we're going to have good days, a long life, and we're going to live in a good world, the first thing we do is we must keep our tongue from evil and from lies. That's the first thing. And don't you know the tongue is the weakest part of our body? And it's the, it's the first thing that, you, you know, you know how muscles work, right? Muscles work by, by you exert a certain amount of stress on them and to the point where ultimately they will fail. You get tired. Don't believe me? Just go out and run a mile. All right? Pretty soon, you're going to start getting fatigued. Go get under a bench press. You can lift, but the longer you go, the harder it becomes. And pretty soon, you get fatigued. How quickly does your tongue get fatigued to where you can't control it anymore? It's like instantly. And I want you all to know, this has gotten me into more trouble. If you are like me, the first point of stress in the world, when things don't go my way, when, when I feel like I'm not getting what I deserve, when my rights are infringed upon, the first thing I do is I pop off, right? That's not you guys, huh? You're not like that. You don't pop off. I do, right? So he says, we've got to figure this out. Notice verse 8 of 1 Peter 3. He, he's going to sum up all that we've been talking about, about living by the grace of God. And as he sums up, look at what he says. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious. He's going to give us five things here. Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And I believe these are the aspects, these are the attitudes of a person who is controlling, who's living in a world where his tongue is not leading him into deceit. Delan, the Greek word for deceit. And he's not leading us into lies and into evil. That's these are the attitudes. So what we want to do is first, let's just break these down real quickly. All right. So grace in Christ gives you and I the ability to actually do these five things. Do you know that? To be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind hearted and humble. Grace does that, not flesh. Remember how last week we talked about learning to respond versus react? These are the responses of God's grace, not the emotional reactions of our flesh. All right? So let's break them down. The first one I want you to see is God's grace gives us the ability to seek harmony. Seek harmony. Now, interestingly enough, we all sing a different tune. All right? Did you hear Nick and uh, Matt up here? God, they sounded so good. It was Nick and Matt, right? I was in the back. But they, you hear them harmonizing? You hear them singing? They were both singing the same words, different tune. If you just heard one of them, you know, I think Nick was singing the melody, you're like, oh, that sounds good. And then if you take Nick away and you hear just uh, Matt, 
Well, it's different than maybe what you have learned, but you could pick it up because it's the harmony, right? But then you put the two together and the song sounds super sweet, right? It sounds beautiful. And that's the idea here. Do you know that the opposite of harmony is contention? Can I, can I confess something to you? I had a church. I had a church tell me this. Oh, I can't believe Why am I saying this? Um, I had a church tell me one time that I was the most contentious person they'd ever had in their elder room. Why are you laughing? That's sad. <laughs> Just kidding. It's the truth. When I heard that, it was like, ah! Ah! It gave me cause to think right? Why am I so concerned about my rights and what I deserve? Why am I not living in harmony with my brothers and sisters? The opposite of harmony is contention. Look at this. Implies the idea of cooperation even in the midst of differences. It's not the idea of all singing the same tune as much as it's the idea of us harmonizing our tunes together. And learning, you know, we all, relationships are what they are. You ever had a relationship where you go, you know what, it's just not going to be perfect. But it's going to be what it's going to be. And I'm going to be okay with it being just this. I may have wanted it to be this great thing, but you know what? To live in harmony, it's going to have to be this way. As God grows us, as He sanctifies us, as He changes each of our hearts, right? That's called harmony. Let me give you, let's look at the next one. Next one is sympathy. God's grace gives us the ability to feel sympathetic. To actually feel for another person. It means suffering with another by entering into and sharing the feelings of others. You find that difficult? Somebody who thinks differently than you? Who maybe, uh, who doesn't going to vote the same way you're going to vote? You find it hard to sympathize with who they are and where they're at and what they believe? Well, that's because we need grace to show us that. We need grace to lead us in that. The opposite of sympathy is indifference. Don't you know, wouldn't it be horrible? Wouldn't it just be the wouldn't it just be destructive to the church if the one of the attributes of Christ was indifference? Can't you imagine? We serve such an indifferent God. Hallelujah. Praise God, Christ was not indifferent to our sin and indifferent to our struggles and our issues, right? The next one he says is act brotherly. Grace gives us this ability to act like a brother. It's the idea of being fraternal, living in fraternity with one another. It's the special love that unites believers. The opposite of this is would be a stranger. If you act like somebody is a stranger to you, it's the opposite of acting brotherly. The next one is giving. Grace gives us the ability to give kind-heartedly. That our hearts would be shaped in such a way that we are bound in kindness to one another. The feelings of affection or compassion. The opposite of this, mean, nasty, uncompassionate. And finally, he says God's grace gives us the ability to live in humility, humbly. Don't you know that when these five things are lived out in our life, when these aspects, these attitudes of Christ are in us, can your tongue, is it going to have the ability to speak evil and lies? Well, no. Because those things are, those things are far from us. And these, these should be the aspects that the world sees of the church, right? These are the things that glorify Christ. Not us out there trying to make a point or or I just don't see the way you see and so you're dead to me. Those things can't exist, right? Now, it doesn't mean that our relationships are perfect, but it means that by God's grace, we can live in peace. Let's look at the next thing he says. Not only must we live uh, in such a way that our tongue is from evil and lies, but we have to turn away from evil and do good. 1 Peter 3, starting the first part of 9, as he's continuing, he says, 
not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. You know, Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. We taught this at the beginning of the summer. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 40 and 41, he says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. If somebody wants to sue you, and, and trust me, if you, this, isn't a, this isn't a talk on you know, legal legality. I understand that things get complicated. But the point of this is that Jesus was saying, hey, human reaction is to return insult for insult. That's human. Do you know that there's three levels, three levels of behavioral communication? Do you know this? There's a satanic level. You know what the satanic level is? Returning evil for good. When you do something good for somebody and they are evil to you, Nabal, satanic. Here David is, he's done honorable things, he's lived honorably, he's protected this guy's flock, and Nabal scorns him. That's called Satan. At satanic level. Then there's the human level. It's the idea of, you insult me, I'm going to insult you back. That's the flesh. You do good to me, I'll do good to you. You insult me, you're going to get it. That's the flesh. And then there's the divine level of behavior. The divine level of behavior says, if you do good to me, I'm going to do good to you, but if you do evil to me, I'm still going to do good to you. That's divine the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, it says, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that, ev- isn't that interesting that a command to the church is that we don't go out just getting revenge or just seeking our rights? Notice what he says, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And then the third thing that David said is our tongue must be kept from evil and lies. We must turn away from evil and do good, but also more specifically, we have to pursue peace. And this probably is the hardest thing for most Christians to do. It's the aspect of becoming a peacemaker. 1 Peter 9, the the, the second part of the verse here, it says, but giving a blessing instead. So not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing. And don't you know that Abraham and the covenant that God made with him, God said to Abraham, he said, you go be a blessing. Now, if you remember when Abraham came to the land of Canaan, were there any other monotheistic tribes in the region? His was the only one. He lived among the Canaanites the pagans. And the covenant that God made with Abraham was that Abraham was to be a blessing to a pagan world, that they were to see something different about him and that it would change them because of Abraham. Uh, God told Abraham that it's going to change the world. You know, the idea of the whole give the world a Coke You know, if that were only true, but unfortunately, Coke is laced with high fructose corn syrup. Who knew? You know, if we could all just have that attitude, you know, you love that commercial, right? Because somebody's having a hard day and they're, you know, their face, (laughs) the music's playing in the background and somebody walks up to him and hands him a Coke. Remember Mean Joe Green? Remember the old, I can't believe I'm bringing this up. Remember the old Mean Joe Green commercial? Mean Joe Green is walking through the, uh, through the tunnel and the kid says something to Green. I can't remember what he says. He hands Green a Coke. Remember that? Because Green was just beat up. And the Coke fixed everything. Jesus is the Coke! Right? Jesus is the Coke in real life. It's the idea not that you can just go around and hand people a Bible. Here you go. I know your world is in shambles, but here you go. No, but it's the idea that the grace of God that he's given me can be harmonious, sympathetic. It can be, uh, I, I don't have to return evil for evil, even though my flesh wants to. Praise God for Abigail, right? That in David's flesh, she stopped him. Don't do this. You're a man of reputation. You're a man of God. 
I know you're going to be the next king and God has anointed you. Don't do this. Praise God for Abigail. That's called making peace, right? Beautiful example of peace. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because these are the sons of God. We are the ones who are going to be the ones that are taking the, the world that is anti-God. And we're going to somehow bring them the gospel that is going to make peace between them and the God of wrath. That's us. We're the peacemakers. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 11-13, it says, To this present hour, this is Paul speaking to the church of Corinth about uh, his reputation and what he deserves. Just look at this. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are both poorly clothed and roughly treated and homeless. Man, we all... I, back up. I'm pointing at finger. I act like I should have the world at my fingertips. I sometimes act like the gospel. Because God loves me, I somehow should have everything in perfect order. That I should have my two weeks vacation. That I should have my retirement. That I should have a certain paycheck income because that's what all the other pastors have, right? Have you ever felt that way yourself? And I love his attitude. I'm homeless. Keep going. Verse 12, he says, and we toil, we work with our hands. It's not like we're sitting in an ivory tower reading books all day. He says, and we are reviled. When we are reviled, we bless. And when we're persecuted, we endure. And when we're slandered, we try to conciliate. We try. We try not to have to fight everybody. We try to live in peace. And we have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even till now. As he's writing this letter, even till now, pursuing peace. Now, why? So if the church can live in peace, and this is maybe a pathway to peace, right? Why would you and I choose to do this? What benefit does this kind of lifestyle have to the world and have to us? It's called purpose. The church has purpose. And the purpose isn't just to feel good sitting in your seat. The purpose isn't just to have a holy huddle of Christians where we can come and sing and have the band play awesome music and we can all lift our hands and we can study the Word and walk out of here and go, ah, oh, man, I'm glad I'm a Christian. Those are great things. But that's not the only purpose. Our purpose extends past this moment right here. It extends as you leave this place. There's a greater purpose in us being called to Christ. That purpose is about you, and that purpose is about the hundreds of other people, the thousands of possible people that you will encounter between now and the day you die. That, that your life might be like David's life. That it brings an exaltation to the Creator. You want to know why David was considered the Camelot king of Israel, the greatest king Israel ever had, is because he rallied the entire nation to the worship of God. And he just, it just kind of came out of him. He just did it. He stood in the gap and he rallied his friends. He said, come do this with me. How many men, when Saul came after him, just flocked to David in the wilderness? We're with you, brother. Because he had that personality of, just come do this with me. We're going to have, God is in control. If we die, we die. If we live, we live. Let's go do this together. It wasn't that he showed up in the temple every Sunday, and that's where it all happened, and then they left, and they were all like, don't tell anybody. We're subversive Christians for Christ. That's not a cool gang. Subversive Christians for Christ is not a cool gang name. Don't put the... Uh, uh, Jeff, don't make the biker jacket say Subversive Christians for Christ. Don't do that. 
The idea is that we're not subversive. And here's why. Look at the text. This is 1 Peter 9, the last part of or 3, verse 9, the last part. It says, For you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. And then he teaches what David taught the people. He said, David says, gather around. You want to know what the fear of the Lord looks like? You want to have good days? You want to have a long life? You want to love, have love on this earth? And then he goes through that. And, and after he talks about your tongue must not be anywhere near evil or lies. You must turn away from evil, do good. You must pursue peace. After he says that, he says this. Look at the screen. This is found in Psalm 34, verse 15 through 18. He says, the eyes of the Lord. Don't you know, this is part of the purpose. Don't you know that this is part of the blessing that we inherit? He says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. Stop. You ever had your dad, I hope you've experienced this. I still love it when this happens. When I do something, I used to, it used to happen on like in athletics, and that used to, when I was a kid. But when I did something amazing, you always want that somebody special to have seen it, right? Did you see what I just did? We still long for that, even as we get older. And some of you, your dads and parents are gone, but you still long for somebody to go, did anybody just see what I just did? That guy just gave me the bird. And I didn't do it. I didn't give it back. Did anybody see that? Our Heavenly Father saw it. Look at the text. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. Don't you know that God loves you? Don't you know that God is for you? Don't you know that God hears and knows what you're struggling with? Don't you know that God knows that this stuff right here that Peter is teaching, that David taught, that's spanning thousands of years to now I'm teaching it? Don't you know He knows that this is hard? But guess what? His eyes see you. They see that. I see what you're going through. I hear your cry. Look at the next verse, verse 16. The face of the Lord is against the evildoer. So it's not just that he sees the righteous, he sees the unrighteous. He sees the wicked. Watch what he says. To cut off the memory of them from the earth. Ha! Huh. And don't you know, we want to leave a legacy but God is stepping in the gap to cut off the memory of the wicked from the earth. Someday you and I are going to stand with Christ on this earth and the memory of the wicked is going to be nowhere in it's going to be nowhere around. We're not going to look back and go, "Huh, remember when that guy gave me the bird?" You're not going to say that. That memory is going to be wiped away. Keep looking, look at verse 17. The righteous cry, the Lord hears delivers them out of their trouble, that this is God's plan. It's not that you're not going to cry. I think so many times Christians teach that you're not going to cry. You're not going to have trouble. That's not the idea. God's going to take care of us in the midst of our trouble. Look at verse 18. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is our God. He's a God who hears. He's a God who intervenes. He's a God who lifts us up, who gives us the grace to manage life in peace in the midst of a world that's not peaceful to us. And because of that, we sing. Because of that, we worship. You ever wondered why you sing Jesus paid it all? You ever wondered why you sing Take to the World? Why we sit here and we sing these songs? is because we've got a guy who, a God who steps in the gap in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our pain, when things don't make sense, it makes sense to Him. And He's good when we can trust Him. Amen?